Well, now for something completely different. So when Beth asked if I'd talk on this, I said, sure, I could never do this before. So now I can say whatever I want and not have to go back to the Census Bureau office and say, crap, I have to do all this work. Um, so I think this cartoon sort of depicts the, the, one of the main issues in, in looking at the politics of this. So many people read this cartoon and say, see, poverty isn't that bad. A lot of other people read this cartoon and say, see, programs really work. And I think this is really the, 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 the conflict that happens, I think, in the politics of, of the SPM. Um, however, I think SPM is one of the a very successful program that's really made a difference. And you can tell it's made a difference when it shows up in the economic report of the president, when Annie Casey now uses it in their state levels, and when the AEI Brookings, a bipartisan group, uses it in their method. Uh, in, their, in their book, and not only that, but Governor Rick Perry has said, we've eliminated black poverty rate in Texas, but we have some meaning for pride in New York. The supplemental poverty rate for blacks is 26%, in California is 30%, in DC is 33%, but in Texas it's just 20%. So this is because of the geographic adjustments of, of what's done in the SPM, but this is Rick Perry saying, how important it is to use the SPM. So you know, and some, with good or bad, it's important to get out there. The other thing is the Heritage Foundation budget blueprint calls for defunding the SPM because it's, they don't like it. And one of the things they don't like is the rel it's a relative poverty measure. And so this is the thing I'll come back to um, when I go through some of what I think are the, the key, what I come, I'm going to call the critical moments of what I think made the SPM um, accepted. So I think it starts back um, with with Pat's book and the NAS report coming up with a different measure. And I think this stimulated a lot, a lot of research. Um, and then there was this IRP conference um, in 1999 where we tried, they tried to get a bunch of people together, researchers from both sides of the aisle, and they voted on particular elements in the NAS. Because the NAS report didn't, didn't give a specific measure, they gave a bunch of different options that you could put together and get a bunch of stuff. And, and some of the things they, they, they agreed on, like, should resources be expanded? Well, everybody agrees that you add more stuff. Um, but should they be adjusted over time in a relative measure? Well, no, people didn't necessarily agree. And should you put medical expenditures? No, no, it wasn't, it was divided. So these issues have been debated for many, many years without, not, and not clear, without a consensus. Um, one of the best strategies is, however, is that BLS and census just continued to do the work. So I think some of this, the success of this is just, they just did it. They just kept moving forward for many, many years, producing these measures as if they were told to produce the measure. Now they produced a lot of them, but still it just kept going. I think that's one of the best strategies I think that worked in this, is this, that people continued to do work even without funding or particular guidance. Um, so the first critical moment, I think, in this is that when Mark Levitan and, and CEO released their um, CEO poverty measure. So they showed that you can produce a measure that the mayor wanted that, and use these data, use this measure to produce something. So I think that really stimulated. Now, this was released in, in 2008, so it took a long time along the way to get there, but I think this is, to me, the first critical moment in strategy and politics that, that allowed the SPM to become a reality. The next critical moment, and I think um, um, Mike mentioned this yesterday, is that Becky Blank suggests an alternative revised poverty measure. So one of the problems, in my view, of the NAS report is they wanted to replace the official measure. Right? And everybody was, everybody was anti that. So when Becky came out and said, let's just do a revised one, a supplemental measure, I think that allowed people to produce something that's not going to replace it. And I think it got a little more acceptance than, than the NAS report. The other thing is this MAPA bill. So it's a, there was the Measuring American, uh, measuring American Poverty, uh, I forget, ma ma what is it? Measuring American Policy Act, right, okay, um, that the House put forward and, and, and it went over to OMB and it caused Peter Orzag to actually write a letter to BLS and Census to say, hey, you should actually pay attention to this. So it got the attention, and nothing's ever passed, it wasn't passed yet, it just got the attention of OMB. So that allowed OMB to 
worry about budget. So um, Obama is trying to come up with evidence-based stuff, right? So there's like $100 million of evidence-based stuff in the budget. Um, and, the, and we were able to convince um, Peter Orzag and Cass Sunstein, this gave Kathy Wallman, who was at OMB, the opportunity to talk to them and say, what we really need to do is we need money to do this. Okay, and so that's when they created this interagency technical working group. Now, one thing about this interagency technical working group I have to be careful about, we all quote this, but I, I must say, it's pretty much Disa, Kathy, Don, and myself, <laughs> who's on this group, right? Now it's with Becky Blank, and Kathy Wallman, and Paul Bug, um, and Jesse Rothstein from CEA, um, and Mark, um, Greenberg from, from, from HHS. So that's the group. So we're getting together and we're voting on these things and there's no particular thing that we voted for that was unanimous. So all of us voted differently and Becky and, and Kathy would then divide this and create this document. So when we say this is a document, it's a, it's a, it was a very good strategy because what it did is it created an official document that came from OMB and Commerce that people now quote. Um, and one of the things I think, the key thing I think you need to work, you need to think about in this quote is in this, in this document is that it says that the agencies can adjust the measure according to methodological improvement. So basically, they just can do whatever they want, right? They can change it however they want. And I think that's the thing, I think in my view, the strategy has to be. So for all of you who want to make changes, that what you should do is you talk to Thesa, you talk to Kathy, you talk to Don, you talk to Trudy, you go to these people and say, you know, I think you should do it a little this way or a little that way. And that's how the changes will occur. The next critical moment is the budget. So with this document, the president put in $7.5 million for the SPM. $5 million for census and $2.5 million for BLS. Now, in my view, it's not the money that did it. It's the fact that in the budget that says you should do this. So census, even though the budget, this is the, mm, this is the 10, no, this is the 11 budget. Even it's the 11, 2011 budget. Census didn't get the money till 2013. So the strategy here was they'll put it in the budget. This will force Congress to vote and say, yes, do that. So that means you have Republicans and Democrats and the White House all agreeing that this measure should go forward. So that was the strategy, right? It was, it, the, it was, the money wasn't necessarily the key, it was the fact that you would then get Congress to vote on something that they would do. Um, and in the census, we didn't get the money for two years. We've st we still kept going forward. In fact, I think when eventually when census got the money, they got the SPM money and then they sucked out SIP money for the same amount. So basically it was a net, no net gain for census. So when Thesa, so when Thesa complains about not having money, it's really not the money that's the issue. In my view, so in my view, what it does is now the commissioner, whenever you hear the commissioner of BLS talk about the budget, she says, yes, and we are getting money to do the supplemental poverty measure to help census. So that gives more advertisement for the importance of this. So that to me is the other critical moment. So then, because of this, right, census releases the SPM. So not only in 2010 did Kathy write a report, but in 2010, 2011 we released it, but in 2010, I think in November of 2010, after the technical working group report came out in March, so only seven months later, there was a new SPM, right? And then eventually there was an actual report. Now you can see it's called the research supplemental poverty measure because there was no money at the time, so we couldn't call it the official, but in 2013, it changed. We're now the supplemental poverty measure. So it went from research to supplemental because of the money. So again, these things are happening even though you don't really notice that it's, it's now an official measure of BLS and the Census Bureau producing this poverty measure. So the final critical moment, I think, is when Columbia um, reported on this historical measure and created a historical supplemental poverty measure and CEA said, well, we want to see the real effects of programs because you do an anchored one. So they created an anchored supplemental poverty measure. So this is either the, in my view, the savior of the SPM or the death of the SPM, okay? Because what it does, if you look at this, which one would you pick? Okay, I would pick the one on the right because look at poverty is falling a lot more than the one on the left and that's sort of what CEA has done. 
However, that removes a, one of the big pieces of the SPM was this quasi-relative measure. In my view, I think it's gonna be the anchored one that's gonna go forward and, and keep being used and used and used. And hence, it'll have all the changes of the benefits in, in income, but it won't change the threshold. So again, it depends on your view of this, whether you accept something that's not perfect, right, or, or accept something that people are gonna accept. Because this then wipes out the Heritage Found with the one on the right, Heritage Foundation has no, no basis for their cut in the SPM, because it's all based on the relative measure. Let's think how much time do I got? So anyway, one of the strategies, so like, to me the kick strategy is just do it. So with the, complication, with the complicated measure, choices matter and stick. So this is the key. In this two month period, we were making all these decisions, how to do housing, how to do the, how to move from a two, two family to a anything two family, or what do you do about, like Lisa said, what do you do about the percent of the median or the 33%? 30, so the problem is you're making these decisions, and I remember the housing one, we were going back and forth of how to adjust for housing one, and I remember talking to Becky at 10 o'clock one night, going through these things, and the next day we're talking about presenting it, and it's now the way we do the SPM. So, and this is again exactly how, how things happen. You just make these choices, and you're based on a entire group of, a lot of research, but a lot of smart people, and they stick because that's the way to, but that doesn't mean it has to be that way forever. Um, even the three parameter scale is something I get nervous about because this was back in 99. So David Betson wrote this, we had these meetings. I remember pushing, I didn't like the two parameter scale. So David and I pushed for the three parameter scale and suddenly people like it. But there's a big issue with the three parameter scale, okay? So the three parameter scale focused on those small units. So this is the ratio of the SPM to the official thresholds. So what it did is it changed the really, it really increased the, the thresholds for these smaller families. And there's the one person, one adult and two adults. And it tried to get those two closer together, okay, the one and two adults with, 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 with single moms and not. But look what happens to these families with really large number of kids. Because you're using a, an elasticity, you're dropping. So this poverty rate for these people falls a lot, right, because they're, the pot goes up a lot, I mean, the poverty, right? So, so this, the threshold really is really, really, no, falls a lot, right? The threshold's really low, so that's right. It falls a lot. So it's a, it's a trade-off, but that's the, the choice we made. Um, so the future. So what I think, I think there's a lot more research is needed. So I think the portability is a big one. To me, misreporting and underreporting is the, are the key, is how you account for the underreporting, how you use, how you move it across surveys. Um, there's the, all the imputing taxes, looking at the thresholds. MOOP and the ACA, I think, is a big deal. It's how you deal with MOOP, the benefit calculations. And of course, I can't, um, I can't be from the PSID and say we can't worry about long-term poverty. And I have to say that you have to look at consumption, wealth, and multidimensional measures. I think those are also important. Um, and I think the key thing, as we learned, is elderly income and poverty. It's, it's really unclear what even elderly income is. So I think there's a lot of research that could be done. I think the way to do it um, is to get everybody to do more research. Um, the portability one is, is, is really problematic. So this, the CPS, so this is the SPM, the black line is the SPM using the CPS. The two red dots are from Trudy's paper on the ACS. Now I, these might be completely non-comparable, but the idea is the ACS is higher and it's going up. The other light blue one is done using trim. So it's done using trim and it makes the adjustments. You can see for underreporting, the, it, the, it, the poverty rate is, low, is lower, but the trend's similar. And then one green dot is SIP. So it could suggest that SIP income is much better than the other income. But then PSID, well, their income's gotta be really good, right? Because their poverty, I just, we just dropped the poverty rate by a lot. But again, when you move it across these surveys, this is the exact same measure using the same things, all the stuff all these measures, there's not really any more imputation in, 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 in the ones at the bottom than anything else. So there's a key problem. Um, so then the future politics. So when you talk to the right, okay, so when I talk to my friends on, on, on the right, their concerns about this is because they feel they were left out of the SPM decisions. So when you look at a lot of these meetings, there's a lot of the people on the right that weren't necessarily there. Um, they also do not like the relative nature of this at all. So this is what the anchored fixes completely. So you could do the anchored and then make adjustments. And they don't like subtracting costs from income. So they don't like putting MOOP on resources or childcare or work-related expenses. Um, 
And this could be, there are, like Thesis said, depending on how you measure this could be a problem, but there are ways you could move healthcare from, from resources to thresholds and make the poverty rate not change, right? You have to give up something in doing that, but you could do that. You could move child care and work-related expenses from resources to thresholds and not have poverty change. And then you'll have a threshold, right, that people, that both sides might be able to agree with, then you can just adjust this over time. I'm not really suggesting this, I'm just saying, if you want consensus across the aisles and want to get this moving forward and accepted by everybody, this might be one of the things you have to, have to do. So my thoughts on the future. Never use this figure. So when you do a research paper, when you write something up, never refer to the official poverty rate and say, oh, look at the trend here. Look at poverty went up during the recession, but, but, but SNAP went way up and people's, and, and if you look at food security, it didn't change. You shouldn't be using this figure. So in my view, all research should never use this. You should use the SPM figure. The other thing is census needs to take over the historical measure, right, so that it's, it's, it's implemented. So we have a measure that goes all the way back. And you have to fix any breaks in series. So this last break in series that occurs here because of the change, somehow you got to fix it so there isn't a break in series. Um, I think you need, you, need, you need to move forward. You need to use the ACS. I think focusing on the ACS for the SPM, um, and in my view, you should move from the ACS um, adjustments to the regional price parities by BEA. So if you look at the poverty rates using either ones, this is from Tootie's paper, they're very highly correlated. Then you will have three of the federal economic statistic agencies producing one measure, right? And these RPPs are official. They're already, all you're doing, you're not doing anything different. These are the official regional price parities that you could just incorporate. Whether they're good or bad, that's not really going to change the state level poverty. I think we have to keep collaborating. I also think some of the funding that was obtained by the agencies should be spread around to do more research. Obviously, the money is really not there, but we all know that there's, there could be $7.5 million in the federal agency doing the SPM. We know it doesn't cost that much to do, but we know that research has to be done. So the original intent was to get some of that money to go to the poverty centers or out to some of you to do research to improve it. Um, I think you have to produce both the anchored and the quasi-relative measure, and then periodically update the threshold. So every 10 years or something, you update the threshold, and then you'll have the anchored and, and go back. And I, I also think you should have a pure relative measure, something that's purely relative, and just say, hey, you know, if you really want to talk about relative poverty, this is what it is. And finally, I think you have to continue to produce both, um, but only use the SPM in research, just like the CPI URS. So if all of us only talked about poverty in terms of the SPM, right, then people would accept it. So the CPI URS, there is not a paper out there when they make historical estimates of income, use the CPI U. None of them do. They all use the CPI URS. So if we just started using the supplemental poverty measure in all our research and refer to poverty that way, then it'll eventually be accepted. I don't think it's ever going to replace, but I do think it'll eventually be accepted. Um, and I do think that um, pushing, getting the agencies and having things like this, I think is really what's going to solidify it in the, in the minds of the policymakers. Thanks. <laughs>